to turn to uh, labor demand shocks, and in particular, shocks to labor productivity. Okay. So now if you want to study that, uh, we can uh, start from our labor market diagram. We have the y-axis, where we are going to put um, labor market tightness. We have the x-axis, is employment. We have the labor force, h. Okay, so we have our tightness here. We have employment here, we have the labor force here. Um, we're going to put our labor supply, which has unchanged here. Labor supply of theta. We have our labor demand, which in this setup is um, perfectly horizontal. So that's due to the um, assumption we made that um, the production function was linear. The fact that the labor demand is horizontal here really has nothing to do with the wage function that we choose. Um, here we've chosen a bargain wage, but if we had chosen a rigid wage and we had assumed a linear production function, we would still have a horizontal labor demand uh, relation. So this is really driven only by the shape of the production function because we've assumed the linear production function. Okay. Uh, so here we have our labor demand relation, which is going to be horizontal. The equilibrium is at the intersection of these two curves. This is the equilibrium level of employment. This is the equilibrium level of tightness. Okay? And now we are looking at our labor demand shock. We assume that A, labor productivity um, goes up. And the question is what's going to happen here. So labor supply is not going to change. So labor demand is going to change because the labor demand, as we had said earlier, depends actually on A. So what happens to the labor demand relation? Is it going up or is it going down? Well, we can go back up a little bit to our equation. And you can see that, uh, so maybe I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to write that down below just to analyze it. So this is the labor demand relation. I'm going to uh, carry that over. So this is the relation that we have. Uh, The labor demand theta d is defined by 1 is equal to 1 plus tau of theta and 1 minus beta z over a plus beta 1 plus r theta. Okay, um, and so now what I'm saying is that our labor productivity is going up. So a here is going up. What must happen to theta for the equation to continue to be true? So we want the um, right hand side to be equal to 1. Okay, I increase a. As a result, z over a here, this is going to fall because a is higher. So z over a is lower. 1 minus beta, z over a is lower. Okay, 1 plus tau of theta that we have here is positive, everything else is positive. So now it means that. Um, our right hand side is lower, okay, because I've lowered the z over a. So my right hand side is lower, but I want it to continue to be equal to 1. So tightness has to respond in such a way that the right hand side remains equal to 1. And so what must happen to tightness? Well, we know that tightness has to increase. Why? Because if tightness goes up, tau of theta the Rochester producer ratio, it's, a, it's an increasing function of tightness. So if theta goes up, 1 plus tau of theta is going to go up. If theta goes up, beta 1 plus r theta is going to go up. Because r, of course, that's a it's a positive number, right? It's a recruiting cost. So the 1 plus tau of theta would go up, the beta 1 plus r theta would go up. And therefore, if it goes up enough, it's going to balance. The reduction is 1 minus beta z over n. The equation can remain true. So what we learn from that, is that if a goes up, it has to be that theta d of a goes up. 
So basically, um, the labor demand is going to be stimulated by an increase in productivity. So when workers are more productive, um, essentially hiring workers is more profitable and therefore firms are willing to tolerate a higher tightness uh, in equilibrium. Okay, uh, so firms are willing to continue to post vacancies even if the tightness is higher and therefore harder to recruit just because once you have a worker, that worker becomes more profitable. Okay, so here what's going to happen in our diagram because we are looking at a case where um, A increases, our labor demand is going to go up, so something like this. So that's our new labor demand. Theta D is going to go up like this. So that's the labor demand. You can call it theta D uh, prior. Okay. So as a result, we have a new equilibrium. Uh, the new equilibrium is here, and you can see employment here is uh, at a higher level. So we've uh, boosted employment. Tightness. Theta prime is also at a higher level. What happens to unemployment? So earlier unemployment was here. That was you. Now unemployment is much less. Unemployment is here. So unemployment has shrunk. So overall what we get here, and of course the size of the labor force H hasn't changed, which means the unemployment rate has also, uh, has also been shrinking. So here we get uh, we get to something that looks much more like a business cycle. Something that's much more realistic. So after an increase in A, what do we have? So employment L is going up. So we, and you know, of course, um, so that's going to be, we have a boom or an expansion. What happens to the labor market tightness? That also is going to go up. Okay, so that means that our tightness here is going to be pro-cyclical. It moves with employment. The unemployment rate U is falling. So U is counter-cyclical. What happens to uh, uh, the vacancy rate, for instance, or the number of vacancies? So U is falling, the unemployment level is also falling. Here, both of them move together because the size of the labor force is falling. What happens to the vacancy rate? Well, we can use the same argument as before. We remember that in equilibrium, uh, flows are always balanced. You know, so the size of firms and the number of people who are unemployed is stable, and we always have S times L when flows are balanced, so these are the inflows into unemployment is equal to the outflows from unemployment, which is the number of new matches, which is given by the matching function M of U and V. And what we've said is that in good times, the number of workers who have jobs is going up, so the inflows into unemployment is going to increase. The number of unemployed is falling. So if you want that balance flow assumption to, uh, so these are the outflows. If you want the balance flow equation to remain valid, it has to be that the number of vacancy must go up. So that at the end, the number of matches uh, that require to balance people who lose their job is actually, uh, is actually going to be there. So we have enough matches to compensate the S times L people who lose their jobs. So number of vacancy has to go up here. Um, so what we infer is that V is going up in good time. So vacancies, and that's you know the vacancy rate as well will go up. So um, V vacancy rate or vacancy level is uh, pro-cyclical. Which is exactly what uh, you know, what we see in the data. In good times, we have higher tightness, higher vacancies, lower unemployment. Basically, the economy has moved along a beverage curve to a point 
with lower unemployment and higher vacancies. So exactly as in the model with rigid wages, when we use labor demand shock, we get qualitatively um, fluctuations that are uh, realistic. Okay. So here's the conclusion that under labor demand shocks, <coughs> Fluctuations have realistic features. This, this is a, a qualitative statement, meaning that the variables <coughs> move in the right direction, which wasn't the case. Uh, this wasn't the case with labor supply shock. Okay, uh, so now we found a type of shock that generates realistic business cycle fluctuations. The last question that we have to observe, that we have to address, um, which is a question that we also tackle when we have the wages, is whether the amplitude of the fluctuations in tightness, unemployment vacancies can match the amplitude that we observe in the in US data. Now the key statistics that we were trying to match was to generate an elasticity of labor market tightness with respect to productivity of eight, which is roughly what it is in US data. So a 1% increase in productivity in US data generate an 8% increase in tightness. And you know, symmetrically, a one person drop in productivity generates an eight person drop in tightness. Can we get that in the model with bargain wages under you know, kind of realistic calibration? 